Hey everyone, welcome to our real interview experience series. As you know, we share our subscribers' interview experience here. So one of our subscribers, Faraz Ahmed, recently cracked our developer interview at HCL. So in this video, I'm gonna share everything about his experience, what he shared with me. And guys, if you have attended any interview recently, then fill the form below in the description. We will reach out to you. You can choose to share your name or share your interview experience anonymously. We are also giving gift cards to the participants. So don't miss out and don't forget to subscribe to catch more videos like this. So now let's get started. So guys, he applied through LinkedIn for a role open for three to seven years of experience and he's having total three plus year of experience. There were two rounds. The first round was technical round. This went around 50 minutes and the second round was HR and managerial round. This went around 30 minutes. Okay. So now I'm going to discuss each portion of technical interview one by one thoroughly. So let's get started. So first we'll tell you ask the difference between controller and rest controller and spring. So the controller is used to return views like HTML pages while rest controller is used to return data like JSON or XML directly. Okay. Rest controller is a combination of controller and response body. So it skips view resolution and sends a response body as it is. Then he asks, can a controller returns a string or JSON response and how so years a controller can return a string or JSON to return JSON. We should use response body annotation on the method or response body annotation with control annotation. This drives a spring to send or return the data like JSON directly, not as view name. To return a spring view, just return the view name. Okay. Then interviewer asks, what if you return a plain string but forget to add response body annotation? So spring treats the string as a view name. It will try to find a render a view like JSP or HTML page with that name instead of sending the string as a response. Okay. Then he asked about hash codes equals contract and why is it important? So the hash code equals contract means if two objects are equal, uh, they must have the same hash code. It's important because collections like hash map and hash set use both methods to store and find objects correctly. Before moving ahead, guys, I would like to share one important thing with you. Actually, we had launched complete integration material structure step by step by myself, expert and MNC's interviewers. And the best part is that now no one need to go anywhere else to prepare interviews. There's a 99% chance that interviewers will ask questions from this material. So basically it contain a lot of material categorized by experience level means each experience level has different material with all possible interview question and answer for Java, Spring Framework, Maven, Git, Spring Boot, Spring Security, Spring Data, JPA, Kafka, Microservices, Java coding questions, Stream API coding questions and many more. I provided the link to get this in the below description if someone need this material plus two real client enterprise projects for reference plus one on one lifetime doubt sessions and the referrals to the big MNCs then they should check the interview preparation kit. I will provide the links for this as well in the description below. So now moving to our interview experience. Then they ask what happens if a hash function always returns the same value and how will it store values. So if a hash function always returns the same value, all entries go into the same bucket. This causes many collisions. Instead of fast lookup, it uses a linked list or tree to store the items in that bucket, making access slower from O1 to ON time and performance gets worse. Then they asked how can we use the value annotation in Spring Boot. So in Spring Boot value annotation injects values from application or properties or application .yml into fields by using it like uh, value annotation above a variable. Spring reads a property and assigns its values. Then interviewer asks if you want to inject a dynamic port number from different config file, how will you use a value annotation? So to inject a dynamic port from another config, first load that files using property source annotation, right in your class, then use value annotation about that field. Spring then Spring reads the value from config or properties and injects it. Then he asked about qualifier annotation uses. So qualifier annotation is used in Spring to choose the right bean when multiple beans of the same type exist. We can use it with auto ride annotations, qualifier annotations to tell Spring exactly which beans to inject. 
then they ask if you use qualifier annotation on spring class that only has one been defined so spring will inject that bean without any issue the qualifier annotation is just extra information it's not needed in this case but it won't cause any errors so it simply tells spring to use the specified beans even if only one exists then interval asks about immutable classes in Java and how to implement one. So immutable classes in Java are classes whose objects cannot be changed after creation. To make one declare the class final, make all fields private and final and initialize them through a constructor and don't provide setters. Then he asks can an immutable objects have a mutable field? So yes, an immutable objects can have a mutable field but it breaks true immutability. If the mutable fields is written directly, its content can be changed from outside. To keep immutability, return a copy of the mutable objects instead of the original, so the internal state stays safe. Then they ask, suppose you are designing a thread safe value objects, use across threads. How would you ensure immutability? So to ensure immutability for a thread safe value object, makes a class final, use private final fields, initialize all fields via constructors and avoid setters. For mutable fields, return deep copies, this prevents changes after the creation. So the object is safe to use across multiple threads without synchronization. Okay. Then he asked about the purpose of serialization in a POJO and in what scenarios is it commonly used. So serialization in POJO lets us convert the object into a byte stream so it can be saved to a file sent over a network or stored in a memory. It's commonly used in caching, file storage, sending data between systems or saving objects straight for later use. Okay. Then they ask about singleton pattern and how can you implement it in Java. So singleton pattern ensures only one instance of a class is created in the whole application. So we implement it in Java. First, we have to make the constructor private, create a static instance inside the class and provide a public static method to return that instance. Then they ask how do you ensure the logger is a singleton in a multi-threaded logging app. So to ensure the logger is singleton in a multi-threaded application, we should use a thread safe singleton pattern. We can use enum singleton or use synchronized method or double check locking with a volatile instance. Then he asked to explain the solid principle. So solid principle helps write clean and maintainable code. The single responsibility principle means a class should have only one job. Open close principle says classes should be classes should be open to extend but close to modify risk of substitution ensures tight classes can replace parents without issues interface segregation increases small focus interfaces dependency in version uh, means depend on abstraction not concrete classes okay then interviewer asks can you give an example where violating the open close principle leads to bugs so if we modify class to add new behavior instead of extending it we might break existing features. For example, uh, changing a payment class to add PayPal logic inside break cards payments if not tested well. Extending it would avoid touching old code and reduce chances of bugs. Okay. Then they asked, you are refactoring a payment module. How will you apply the dependency inversion principle? So to apply the dependency inversion principle, first we have to define a payment processor interface and let classes like card payment or UPI payment implement it. The main payment module should depend on this interface, not specific classes. Then he asked, what is the difference between fail fast and fail safe iterators in Java? So fail fast iterators shows concurrent modification exception if the collection is modified while iterating. Whereas fail safe iterators works on a copy of the collection and don't throw exceptions when modified and ensuring safe iterations. Fail safe is slower due to the coping but doesn't risk accept, but doesn't risk exceptions during concurrent changes. Okay. Then he asked how do we handle global exceptions Spring Boot application. So this is very common question. So we can handle global exceptions by using controller advice, define a class annotated with controller advice annotations and use exception handler annotation method to handle specific exceptions globally. Then he asked what is the difference between array list and linked list when would you use one over the other. So this is also the common question array list is blocked. Error list is backed by an array providing faster random access but slower insertions and removals. Whereas linked list is a doubly linked list offering fast insertions, removals but slower access. We should use array list when we need quick access and linked list when we need frequent add remove elements 
from the beginning or the middle of the list. Then he has a difference between abstraction and encapsulation. So abstraction hides complex implementation details and shows only the necessary features focusing on what an object does. Whereas encapsulation wraps data and methods into a single unit, restricting access to some of the object's components, focusing on how the data is managed. Okay. Then they ask what are clustered and non-clustered indexes. So, and how do they impact query performance? So, a clustered index sorts the data rows in the table based on the text key. So, there is only one clustered index per table. A non-clustered index creates a separate structure pointing to the data. Uh, then going forward, they ask write an SQL query to count duplicate values in a column. So I'll provide a solution link of this question in the below description. So guys, this is all about SQL interview experience. And please don't forget to check the interview preparation kit below. Thanks, Q.